And we are live. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to Ubuntu on Air community stream. My name is Yannick. I'm the French guy from Switzerland. And tonight I'm not going to do any development stuff or, or anything. But I was thinking, you know, I used a web server. I used a graphical tool. And I used an operating system. And what do those things have in common? Well, at some point, in one way or another, they have to talk to the kernel, the Linux kernel that uh, runs everything in there. So I thought, you know, it's a good subject to talk um, on the Ubuntu on their channel. But I don't know jack about the kernel. So I opened my Rolodex, Rolodex and I looked up uh, someone who can talk about that for, uh, with me. And so I invited a violinist. Well, he turns, it turns out that he is also a Linux kernel developer. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stream, Mr. Andrea Riggi. Hello. Good evening. You are muted. Let me unmute you if I can. Uh, I can't unmute you. You are muted. Now, is <laughs> it go. working? Yes, okay, it is. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you, Yannick. Thank you for uh, joining this uh, this this thing uh, and for being the <laughs> guinea pig of sorts for the this yeah. first interview. Love the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So talking about being a violinist and being a, a, a Linux kernel and stuff like that, um, can you introduce you in just a few words so that uh, you know people know why you're here? Yeah. So okay. Uh, so that it, it doesn't sound confusing. I, I violin, being a violinist, my hobby, I, I'm mostly a kernel guy. I work in the canonical kernel team. Uh, and more exactly, I maintain the, what is called the development kernel. So whenever a, a new kernel comes out on kernel org, uh, or we try to keep track of the latest kernels, I take the kernel, um, I maintain that I apply the Ubuntu, what we call the Ubuntu special source, a uh, set of patches that we maintain. And we make sure we, we run tests and we make sure that everything is working and it's not breaking badly. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, that, uh, that's, that's, always, that's always cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. But like it, it's, a, it's an interesting job because you get to see like a lot of different issues and challenging things sometimes. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty cool. All right. Okay. So my first question is it might sound like a dumb question, but I actually don't really know what what is the kernel. What does it do in my system? So can you uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Let's let's like it, this is very confusing for for many people. Even sometimes even programmers is like, what is the kernel exactly? Uh, you know, because at the at the very end, you can see as the kernel as a very big library. Because usually, from a software development perspective, what you do at some point, you 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 call some functions, some library functions, and you rely on what the library is doing to implement a certain feature or or, or do something. And this is basically what the kernel is doing to a large degree. It's a giant library. And everything runs inside the kernel. And it's not about providing like uh, features. It's, it's also behind that. There's a lot of management going on, like uh, taking care of, of allocating memory, releasing memory. Uh, if, you, if you want to write something on, our, on your hard drive or on a file system, the kernel is taking care of that. So it implements a kind of allocation policy or stuff like that, create a file. Uh, not only that, it, it, you can create processes, uh, kill processes, stop processes. This, all these concepts are provided by the kernel. So all the programs that you run, like if you, if we, if we are running, I'm running this inside my browser. Well, my browser is running inside the kernel. So it's, uh, it's not like those that wrote the browser don't have to re-implement every single time, like to talk with or, or talk with the video card driver to do, draw this window of, or implement a, a keyboard driver to read what I type in my keyboard. They just rely on common functionalities provided by the kernel. Same if you want to create a process, you don't have to 
program the to know the details of the architecture when you run there's just some abstraction that you rely on and, and you can create processes using high level function calls there and usually these interfaces to the kernel are, are called system calls they are special function calls at the end and so yeah this is what the kernel is doing it's a it's really, sometimes it's really hard to define what is a kernel because like especially nowadays uh, and if the if the if there's a chance I, I can i can probably try to show something some sure. code or similar uh nowadays it's like uh, before there was always the this 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 boundary where you have user space and kernel space nowadays sometimes it's kind of mixed we have things like bpf uh, that means like bpf is a like a virtual machine that is running inside the kernel and it's really really useful for debugging we can maybe we can show some examples later but the cool thing is that you can create uh, some binary code in user space and inject that in kernel space at runtime so we can reprogram the kernel somehow of course in a secure sandbox but you can do pretty cool things like with, with this and uh, it's, awesome. it's really interesting awesome so how how is the kernel built because i have this image in my head that to build the kernel you need the kernel <laughs> yeah, so. yeah exactly that's like a chicken and the egg problem like how can you yeah. can you create something if there's nothing and that was like something that was really fascinating i mean i i, I was very attracted to this concept when i started i was like how is this possible like you have a a naked hardware and you can create something from from nothing and yeah that that part is really interesting and it's pretty i i actually start when, when i started to to be passionate about kernel programming my dream was like to create my own kernel and to, to see how it works so i actually started to do that and i brought my little tiny little kernel uh it took me like a year when i was studying at the university <laughs> but it was a fun <laughs> project and it's really satisfying when you see like the something that it, that is that is coming up and the, you have nothing because you have the hardware at the end and you see a shell that is that is born <laughs> from nothing that, that, yeah that must it's, be really uh, satisfactory it, it's yes it's really i, I remember like I, I, i'll tell you a story like i when i was studying like the intel architecture i was looking at the um hardware multitasking so it's a functionality in the intel processors that you can the hardware provides some hardware specific uh, mechanisms that allow you to define multiple tasks so as a test i i brought like a, a simple program that was interacting with the cpu and the video driver and was printing like on the console like a a a a a a set of a and then another task also implemented in hardware that was printing b b b b b and i remember i showed that to my uh to my wife at that time and <laughs> i was like look look what i did i programmed my computer to print a and b using intel uh, in, intel multitasking with the task set state and everything look at that and and she was not impressed because there was like a b a b a b a b yet it was obviously multitasking because there are two separate threads that were printing a and b and she was like well i can do that in office like in in five minutes <laughs> <laughs> yeah well <laughs> <laughs> not the same but <laughs> no it's not <laughs> so how, how do you actually uh, do that yeah so um that's so the part that you you need of, of course you need a system that is running uh and and you need a compiler like any program and you can build the kernel using a compiler like any other program but then the, the difference when you when you build a kernel is that you can reboot into your compiled kernel and recompile the kernel from the kernel itself so it's like it's pretty cool because you, you have a program that runs the compiler that compile itself so that's wow. that's, <laughs> that's kind of inception <laughs> inception it's it's kind of yeah 
And it's, right. it's really nice when you when you write a kernel and you start because there, there are standards like the, the POSIX is the po popular standard, like Linux is a POSIX operating system, like Unix or Minix or BSD. Uh, they basically they provide some common system calls. And if you implement those system calls, you can recompile a um, you, you can recompile your like like any any program like bash for example or your a shell or any program you try to run that in your kernel and if you have done everything properly it it runs inside your kernel this is what this is my experience with my little kernel like when i, I remember i never got to run bash but i was able to run some uh, small c programs i remember i ran a, a ruby cube solver that i downloaded from the internet and i ran that on my on my little kernel it was so exciting to see like that it was running because i was providing the system calls that this program was expecting to find uh assuming that it was running on linux but it was not running on linux it <laughs> was running on my kernel that was providing this this system calls. awesome uh, awesome so once you get once you have the kernel and the system calls implemented uh, do, do you need anything else around that or is everything that we find on our ubuntu distros uh just well not just but um stuff that make the distro but not stuff that make linux is is, is linux really just the kernel yeah that's the, that's the thing of course not uh there's the the kernel is like the, bare, the the basic program that the first program that runs is not really a program, but like you can see it this way, it's the container. Then you need to put something into this container, and what you put is a lot of programs, and there are called called user space programs. So you have your shell like Bash, you have your your graphical environment, uh, you have a browser, uh, you may have a compiler, a text editor, all these components are not part of the kernel. They are separate programs, separate projects uh, maintained by a lot of different people. And, but, but what is important and what is cool is that they're separate projects that rely on the same uh, infrastructure that is system call infrastructure pr provided by the kernel. So um, when you install Ubuntu, what you do, you, you install the Linux kernel, Plus, you install a lot of other packages or user space components that run inside the Linux kernel, and that's the distribution. And the value that you get from a from using, because theoretically you could recompile your own kernel and recompile all your uh, user space application, and, and you don't have to use a distribution. The value that you get by using a distribution is that everything is packaged properly and tested so that you know that you know, somebody else has properly tested everything. So the mix of user space components and kernel component is supposed to work better than if you do that by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah. I know I have tried two or three times and failed two or three times to build the Linux from scratch uh, project. So that basically builds the kernel and then build stuff on top of that. But I always mess something up and... Uh, in the end, I'm very happy I can, you know, sudo apt install stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot more practical than uh, redoing. Like it, it feels like I don't know reinventing the wheel if you yes. do everything from scratch. It, it's not worth yeah. it. Uh, but it's I mean it's a good experience to try to recompile the kernel because you you can learn a lot. I guess. Uh, yes. Even you if you're not yeah. even if you're not a kernel dev or if you don't care about the kernel i think it's would be nice to, to try the, the linux know, from scratch project is interesting in, in the sense that it shows how the basic structure of a linux system uh, you you just by reading you know what programs are needed to build the kernel and then boot the kernel and then keep uh, adding the 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 things you were talking about the the, the a shell a grab a recompiled grab because you, you will need that said and stuff like that it's really interesting to to actually just try once um i never 
manage to get a running system, but um, maybe I'm going to try a fourth time someday. <laughs> we have an interesting... Reading... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was saying, I was reading the comments. Was like, yeah, I, I was, I was going to say, we have an interesting <laughs> comment from some random users in our chat. Oh, no, it's Monica. <laughs> it's not a random user. <laughs> um, yeah, most interesting, the kind of patches that make all my cool RGB accessories light up and do cool things. Actually, that brings uh, a question. All those drivers for all all our um, hardware, and you know, we've got like hundreds of uh, hardware stuff, like from from USB sticks to uh, you know Stream Deck or or RGB keyboards or headsets. How does that uh, all those drivers they, they seem to magically appear? How, how does that work? How does how does that integrate with the kernel? Yeah, so the, there's a lot of a lot of stuff in the kernel. It's a big project, and uh, it's it's actually so people are scared when they try to approach the kernel because it's it's a natural feeling because it's a, like for, first of all they're scared because of like oh yeah I'm going to touch something that is too close to the hardware so that's yeah. a, that's that's scary already. Then you you take a look at the code and it's huge it, it's humongous <laughs> i think nowadays they're like like 10 28 29 million lines of code if i'm right <laughs> oh, we, can, wow. we can check what wait yes can, can i share the sure i would share your screen yeah so like i have the source code here uh there are folders and files and what I can do, let me see if I, um, let me get the, the, I have the command. Uh, that, that didn't work. Can you, can you see? Uh, I think uh, your screen is frozen. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, okay. Now. It, okay. Okay. I'm back. Okay. Sorry. Ah, okay. So I was just copying the command. Like, okay. So this one is searching for. Um, all the dot c dot h dot a s basically it's c file okay. header file and assembly code because a little bit of code is written in assembly and it's mm -hmm. counting how many lines uh, each file has and then it's uh doing a, a sum of everything this counts the amount of lines of code and we have oh yeah I, I, like i was saying this is one, two, three, oh one, two, three, God. 28, almost 29 <laughs> million lines of code. I remember when oh, I wow. started, when I started to do kernel stuff, it was two millions. So now we have, we have like uh, almost more than 20 uh, million. So that was it's, this, it's a lot of, uh, what, it's a lot of code. Uh, I'm, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And, and it's 29 only, million lines. Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's not only that static amount of code it's uh, it's how it changes like for example now we have we, we are at 515 linux just linux just released the 515 like like over over the weekend uh if i want to see like i don't know the changes from version 515 uh, uh the last one was rc7 so 515 rc6 and rc7 let's see I'm saying these are the changes from an, an R, uh, release RC6, uh, a release candidate, and, and another release candidate. Just to get an idea, there's a new release candidate every week. So mm -hmm. if I count that, uh, it's like, yeah, that, that was a calm week. <laughs> there's only 255 uh, uh, changes. So these are patches, basically. And if I want to see, uh, let's see the the stat. If the stat, uh, how much how much it changed? Like there, there. Well, it, it was pretty calm. <laughs> Two thousand insertion, one thousand deletion. This is only in one week. If I look like oh, the wow. previous week, uh, so this is two week ago, weeks ago. It's yeah, it's a little bit yeah, more like almost. Yeah. Three three thousand seven hundred insertions, two thousand deletion, and three hundred files changed. Uh, let's go back to RC four, RC five. Again, 
Uh, let me see if there's a big one. I think this one was a big one. Yes, it's for 4,000. Yeah. Because basically, when there's a new, the development process is that, that there's a there's new release candidate, RC1. And this is when the merge window opens. So all the developers are pushing to, to uh, are sending their stuff to the mailing list, asking to, uh, to you know, include their own changes, new stuff, new features, new drivers. Everything is merged and the R R RC1 is made. And then there's like the first week is pretty much calm because everything has been merged. And then the second week, uh, things start to go crazy because there are new bugs, uh, new things that are coming up, the things that were missing. Uh, so usually like the RC, I would say RC2 and RC3 is like the biggest one. Well, in this case, it was uh, RC3, RC4, the biggest one. Uh, but yeah, that was like every week we have from 2,000 to 4,000 changes like insertion or 2000 deletions but basically we have a lot of stuff that are, that are changing and uh, these are obviously drivers our core kernel features uh, a lot of mixed things uh, and yeah to, so to, to answer your questions like of course the kernel is not loading all these drivers each driver has like a kind of detection procedure uh, and uh, that 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 is trigger like when the uh, either when when there's a certain event happens or when this or when the system is booting and it's only loading the the drivers that it needs this is why the the kernel is a it's called a modular kernel because there are separate modules it's not that you compile everything statically into a single binary there are multiple binaries we have the kernel that is a is a, it's like an ex executable file. And then we have those that are called the kernel object or the .ko files. Usually each KO file implements a specific functionality. It can be a single driver or a file system or a network driver or, or a network protocol, for example. And so depending on the commands that you run and the hardware that you have, uh, the core kernel subsystem takes care of loading only the binaries that you need. Otherwise, your okay. machine would be uh, bloated by <laughs> the amount of. Well, code. I do remember a time, you know, <clears throat> back in the days, how, how, how we say to not uh, specify any um, <laughs> timeline, uh, when you actually had to compile everything statically in the kernel. I, I remember uh, it was. Yeah, a long time ago, you had a make file and you had, you know, checkboxes and you had to say, okay, my hardware is this Sun Blaster 16 and I need that driver inside my kernel, recompile that. And, and but now that that's, that's gone. Thanks. Thanks, kernel team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are cool features like the, the, the there's still the, the make, the make uh, process is still the same as long time ago at least when i started I, I started to do kernel stuff i think it was like around 2004 maybe before 2002 2004 and yes yeah, so i remember everything was, was static you could only <laughs> say yes or no then they added the module option yeah. uh, so you can compile a certain feature as an external module and then uh well usually what i do is to is to run make menu config i still do that if you, oh, thank you for the shell. Uh, I run make menu config, and there's yeah, this that, that very nice interface <laughs> that I've always used. And so, that for thing, example, yeah. if you need a specific, uh, like this, this is like it's a kernel that I use for testing. So I removed a lot of features, like that. There's not even Bluetooth compiled in. And if, if I want, you see that this asterisk mean that the binary is going to into the the main object file, the main executable of the kernel. And if I put an M, that's going into a, a, a kernel object, a separate KO file. So if okay. I don't have any Bluetooth, if I don't, don't use any Bluetooth functionality, it's going to sit in my hard drive and it's not loaded in memory at all. Mm. Uh, Excellent. And, okay, and before we, we move on, we have a couple of questions. Uh, oh, yes, I don't know. Yes. 
I don't know if you can answer this one. Uh, I just put it here. To if you if you don't have an answer, well, that's, uh, that's no, no, that's that's, that's okay. correct. It's a correct okay. assumption that Microsoft contributes a lot in the Linux kernel, and it's amazing that they're investing a lot in Linux. There are some speculations that, like, the next version of Windows will have a Linux kernel. <laughs> <laughs> Same as Mac OS, then. Uh, something like that. Well, Mac OS is more uh, uh, is more BSD. The BSD, uh, yes, of course. But but still, it's uh, you know they're they're investing a lot in the compatibility layer. I don't remember how it's how it's called W WSL L, 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 exactly. Windows sub uh, subsystem for Linux. Yes, yes. So they're investing a lot and they contribute a lot in the Linux kernel. And one thing that that probably uh, people don't realize is that uh, like Microsoft is running Linux in their cloud. They're using Linux because on the server side, of course, using Linux is, is, is far superior from uh, as an operating system, like as a kernel, like more than any other, <laughs> uh, better than any other operating system. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's normal that they are willing to invest a lot in the in the Linux kernel. They contribute a lot upstream, also. Yeah, I've um, I've I've seen in in different chat that they are doing also lots of stuff for open source projects now. So, yeah, the the evil evil Microsoft of the old days may have you know have gone yeah. and <laughs> might have been replaced by something that is actually open source friendly. So let's uh, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah, they're. Yeah, they're more more willing to to well, I don't know share code not not share code but contribute to some open source projects. Absolutely, that that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Monica has another question. If someone is interested in getting started in kernel development, what do you recommend that they do? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, there used to be a nice project uh, that unfortunately is is closed now. It was called the Udeep Tula Challenge. I think you can still find the code somewhere in, in it was called like, like the Udeep Tula Challenge. Like this, maybe you can see. Um, basically, it was a set of exercises, like kernel exercises, or uh, I don't know, kernel riddles, I don't know how to call that. You sh you had to solve all of them in order to access to the next, you, you know, you, you needed to solve like the exercise number one to access to exercise number two and so on and so on. So it was like a game. It started with the first one was write a hello world uh, kernel module. And, 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 and it was cool because it was covering all the aspects of the kernel in a you know, incremental uh, steps, step by step uh, way. So it was starting with the most, the, the easiest exercise that is writing a hello world module, and then it was progressing through interrupt routines or. or Huh. At the end, there was like a, an internet driver, if I remember, uh, and more, more complicated things basically, um, and. It, I think you can still find something on GitHub. And even if it's not maintained, it's not that it needs to be maintained, but even if it's not maintained anymore, I think it's a, it's a good exercise to go through these, uh, um, these exercises. Uh, however, this is like, nowadays we have really cool things that I wish I had when I started. <laughs> and I mentioned <laughs> that before, it's, it's, it's B BPF. BPF is great. It's basically, um, like I was saying, it's a virtual machine that is running inside the kernel and you can uh, reprogram this virtual machine. And if it was a separate CPU that can access the entire kernel memory and you can like explore and look what the kernel is doing at runtime. Uh, in this way, you, you can like really uh, define I don't know, put your probes into the kernel as if it was a, a circuit, you know, yeah. with the, uh, if you're an electrician, and you, the oscilloscope and you see what's going on. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I can show some examples, for example. That, that, yes. That's cool, like like BPF, that there's a 
tool, a user space tool written on top of PPF that is called PPF trace, uh, this one. And it's really easy. You can find a lot of documentation about this. Um, like, I don't know. Let's see. I, I haven't prepared anything, so I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just <laughs> improvise some examples. Yeah, wing it. <laughs> it's our way of doing things. <laughs> um, the, the language, so it's, yeah, yeah. the language is, is, uh, it's pretty trivial. It's, it's a, it's not C or, or it's a custom language, but it's really easy to, to learn. Like usually what I do, let, let's say I want to, um, how about, how about we, we want to see how the driver of my keyboard is working. So we, we can try to implement, I don't know, a keylogger, for example. Uh, without recompiling the kernel, just everything in user space. But we're gonna peek into the the driver and see what it's doing to you know read the mm -hmm. the characters from my keyboard. So, for example, I expect uh, that my keyboard will be implemented as an, an interrupt. We will use an interrupt routine, right? So, mm -hmm. and it, I, so this K probe means I want to put something a probe into a kernel function. So the first thing that I need to know is determine the kernel function. That my uh, keyboard is, is using, I don't know. And then when this function is called, uh, let's, let's do, I'll, I'll print the function. Okay. So basically with this line this this one liner i'm saying okay i define a k probe in i put a k probe in each function in the kernel that is score called erq and something else and when one of these function is called i'm going to print this function name this is what i'm doing i guess this is going to fail because there are so many erq functions so let's see what it's saying exactly there are, there are 1000 <laughs> functions that are using irq so let's let's try to restrict that to i don't know our, our irq like that this is working so i'm gonna whoo check Ooh. this out <laughs> it's alive but, but, <laughs> yeah exactly so it's calling a lot of rows pin lock so these are these are locks uh, is not what I what I wanted. I, I wanted to intercept interrupt routines. So now now it's taking a while because it's unregistering all these K probes. And what is cool is these K probes. Uh, this is this doesn't add overhead to the system because these K probes. What it, what PPF is doing? It's actually replacing the code. It's rewriting the code live, uh, like binary patching the kernel, adding a jump instruction at the beginning of the function. And the jump is just jumping to the BPF infrastructure, to BPF. And then it's returning transparently to the function. When I kill the program, it's, it's removing the probe by restoring the original micro instruction at the beginning of the function. So it's pretty cool. It's just, you know, it's binary patching the kernel live. Awesome. So let's do, I don't know, instead of searching for uh, IRQ. Let's search for keyboard or 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 or, or KDD. And there's a special file in proc that is called K all sims that is showing all the kernel functions that are defined in my kernel that I'm running right now on my machine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are many. A lot <laughs> actually. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so Let's see if there's let's let's grab for event. Okay, that that looks promising. Like KBD event, it sounds like it might be something that the kernel is using to, you know, to to intercept to, to intercept the events from the keyboard. So let's try to to see when this function is called. Okay, it's not what? Yeah, there's one probe now, not not thousand of probes. If I, yeah, check this out. When I, can you hear ah. when I press, uh, when I press a key, this function is called. Awesome. And this is all runtime. Like now I know that I know the function. 
and, and how do, the, the question now is how do I get to the function? Well, what I do, I, I use C tags. You know, if you if you run make tags in the Linux kernel source code, um, you're going to create a, a file that is called tags. Maybe do I have that? Oh, fantastic! I don't have that, so I need to run make tags because I cleaned up everything, and this is going to take a while. In the meantime, let's see. If there, is there any questions so far? Uh, I don't think there are any, any some any questions, but people are amazed at at what you're doing. It's like black oh. magic, I think. <laughs> so, well, while it's doing that, yeah, we're gonna. So what I is is okay. Go ahead. That no, no, I was saying that. What I wanted to do is to go to the implementation of this function, kbd event, and see what the function is doing and trying to read live the arguments that are passed to this Ooh. function. So reading the art, hypothetically, one of the argument might be the, the scan code that the keyboard is sending mm -hmm. to the kernel. So theoretically, if I can read the scan code uh, and I probably need to map the scan code into a character, but that's a separate process. I would be happy if, I, if I'm able to read the scan code. And that means that I that I have a a, a, a key logger, basically. Uh, yeah, so in, in, in this particular example, the job of the kernel is just to say that key has been pressed, whether that key is a Q on my keyboard or an A on the French keyboard. It's not the kernel's job. To define that, right? Yeah, usually a keyboard works. Uh, it's interrupt based. So when I press a key, an interrupt is triggered in hardware, and the kernel takes care of of running an interrupt routine associated to that interrupt, and uh, then reading from some hardware registers, and the event that might be a key press or even powering off the keyboard or some keyboards are, are, are special special keys to trigger certain actions uh, and then feeding all these events into the main input subsystem because the input subsystem uh, is is an additional abstraction uh, abstraction that the kernel is providing because you you may have like keyboard devices mouse devices uh, any any kind of of you know input uh, subsystems and all of them are registered into the same sub sub subsystems and they are abstracted and yeah and that's that's one of the tasks of the kernel so tags is, is still going why, why is it taking so long well because it's scanning all these 29 millions of lines of code <laughs> <laughs> and this is basically so this is has been generated how big is that it's 700 megs whoa that's big. <laughs> so it's an index each line okay. tells me, so this function or this structure name, you can find the implementation or the definition at this file, this line. So basically, let's see, what was the function called then? KBD event. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I love to use VI. Uh, I don't know what you're using, but I'm a console I'm, guy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big <laughs> VI fan. <laughs> okay, cool. So if I do call tag, and then I put the function after generating the tags file. Look at that. It's cool. I go directly into the function implementation. Excellent. So I, can, I can easily navigate the Linux source code, even if there are like 20 to 30 million lines of code, just one tag and function name, and I get to the to the implementation of the that function. That is excellent. Same with a structure. Uh, like input handle, what is that? I can go here and, and it tells <laughs> me the structure. And it's it's really fast. So for Let's example, take... uh, yeah, check this out. We have we have an input handle. This is probably a structure that represents the specific device. In this case, it, it should be a keyboard probably. And as you can see there, there's like private data op name 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 would be interesting to print i guess it would say it will say usb keyboard something i don't know uh event type event code so value value is interesting because i think this is the scan code that is sent by my keyboard to the kernel 
Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, what is that? Argument one, two, three, four. It's argument four, right? So right. if I go back to what I was calling the four, let's do some decoration, like let's say code equal, uh, let, let's do like, like that. I'm printing in X, uh, what was that? Arg four? Four, right. yeah. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. So, <laughs> was it really <laughs> arg four? Let's see again. KBD Depends if you start at zero. Zero, one. Two. No, it's it's zero base. Zero, okay, one, so two, that's three. Right? Zero, three. One, yeah. two, two. So that's cool. We were we were actually reading random data. This is random. We were, we were reading from a. It's not from memory though. It's from registers. If we want to know which registers, there's Mansis calls, and we can find the ABI down here. Like, let's see. Uh, it was somewhere around here. Register. Uh, eight maybe. Don't remember. It was. It was maybe Mansis call. Maybe it was here. Yes, there it is. It basically is showing the which registers are used uh, to pass function arguments. So like in x86.64, you can see that, uh, well, now I, I can't find it, but it's in here. Yeah, there it is. Arg1, Arg2, Arg3, Arg4. So if we go down to x86.64, First argument is passed by RDI, RSI, RDX. So we were actually reading from register R10 that was containing random data, but that's fine. It's not a security issue. We were not violating any memory constraint because we were reading from a register, from a CPU register. Okay. So what I want to do instead is ARG3, and let's see yeah. what we get. Hmm, we're still getting a weird number, so maybe maybe it's not that. Uh, let, oh, sorry, what did I? Uh, so, you okay. need to put on another item. Yeah. Okay. Let's try okay. argument two. Why not? So, yeah, this is probably this is probably a function that is not passing uh, the scan code because we can see it's interesting because when I when I keep the key pressed, it shows one. And when I release, yeah. it shows zero. So this this function is probably telling me when I press a key and I release a key instead of yeah. telling me in the scan code. Mm -hmm. So it's still pretty let's cool. See if, let's see if there's a function called uh, KBD code, maybe. There's a KBD key code. Ah, this that sounds promising. Sorry, I'm just, you know, this is not prepared. So I'm just. Hey, look it. at that. <laughs> it says this key is, code. This is cool. This is cool. This is probably what we needed. Yeah. KBD key code. I would try to, to, to probe this function and print the second argument or argument arg1, right? So. KBD key, KBD key code. Let's see. Arg one. Uh -huh. Let's try now. I'm pressing A. Hmm. Uh. One or zero. That that's mm, that's weird. Let me see. Is it? Yeah, that's okay. This is arg DZ, arg zero and arg one. I was expecting this interesting. I was expecting to see something like, am I doing right? Arg1 KBD key code. Yes, it's printing one or zero. Yeah. That's weird. Okay. It does anyway. Seem... Anyway, that that's that's the way you. But, debug but you can stuff. see that. Yeah, you can see that you can learn a lot about yeah. the kernel, about just 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 by doing this because it's like. Uh, you know, you, you can explore what your your hardware is doing, what the kernel is doing. You can see, for example, that when I press a key, 
something is happening. Thing, yeah. So th th that function is called. Uh -huh. uh, and and yeah, look at the, the key you pressed is uh is printed. I don't know if that's the. Yeah, I was uh, I was yeah. curious to know why. Oh, that, that, that's intriguing. <laughs> 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 then you can see like you can search this one and see what is calling this function. That that's uh -huh. another full information. Uh, what so what it, basically Linux is all maintained using Git. All the source mm -hmm. code is based on Git. I'm not gonna explain what Git is. <laughs> it's a sort of revision control system. Uh, well, we, I think we can do a whole stream explaining what Git yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a little too much. So with Git grep, basically I'm saying search uh, anything in the source code that is using TBD key code. And you can see that there, there's also documentation about that. And usually mm -hmm. you find so many things in the documentation. Like I, I usually open that. Maybe the key code uh, because it, it tells you what 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 it's doing. You know the keyboard C key B D key code uh, and and uh, it gives it even gives you an example. So that that's really that's really cool if if you're trying to learn the how the kernel works. And yeah, yeah, it's called here. That's cool. I was curious to see. So this is the implementation. It's not the. No, this is a, it. It calls the function here. KBD key code. Oh, KBD. Uh, you look at that. KBD event <laughs> is what is yeah. what we were we were using before. Oh, interesting. And, interesting, yeah. And it's pass. There's a KBD row oh, code wait, and KBD wait, key wait, code. Wait, wait, wait. I know what's going on now. I know. Right. Look at yes. that. This is interesting because because. There, there are more KBD key code. One is in, ah. S3, is in S390. It's a, a specific architecture. And one is in drivers TTYB. So I need to go in, in this one. Oh, check this. The function name is the same, but the prototype is different. So what ah, we yes. arg1. So we're printing down, was... and down is probably the flag that, that tells me if the key is pressed on release. So okay. what I want to print instead is arg zero, right? Okay. It's the key code. Let's let's try arg zero, and and I want to print in X. A B. C, oh, there you B, go. C. There you go. Let's try to do a query. Congrats. Where? Yes. Wait. Hold on. U, U, R, T, e should yeah. be progressive. Increasing, yeah, yeah. increasing. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this is the keyboard scan code. Now I just need to write, a, could be a, even a, a user space program that is reading these scan codes and it's mapping depending on my uh, you know, keyboard layout. Mm -hmm. It's mapping this scan code into characters and I have my, uh, my key logger. And this works by binary patching the kernel that's isn't that cool like that is excellent <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, I had a few more questions i guess uh we, we still have like 10 10 15 minutes um how how much does your team work with upstream because obviously you guys are not work writing the kernel you're as you of said course. every week you get like four thousand in sessions um how closely do you work with uh, the, the the upstream, and how do you keep up with all those changing? Uh, you were talking earlier about the Ubuntu secret sauce of the kernel. Um, is that like you know uh, merging hell every week, or do you have like uh, some some magic incantation that you do? It, it is kind of merging hell every week. <laughs> 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 no, okay, we we. Um... We do a lot of, of merge and, and it's most of the work is, or at least my work is the work as a maintainer. So I don't get the chance to write a lot of code and contribute upstream. My contributions, if you if you look at Git log and you search my name, most of my contributions nowadays are bug fixes because this is like how we usually contribute to to. To the upstream kernel um 
Recomp and and the, 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 uh, you mentioned the, secret, the Ubuntu secrets. So it's not, it's not actually secret, like we post our patches publicly. Uh, usually there are patches that are not yet accepted upstream, but they're required to uh, for certain hardware components to work. And so we try to support them, even if they're not upstream. This is the typical source patch, uh, the Ubuntu source patch. Or another example of a source patch could be like, uh, some some fixes that we need or some optimization that we need that is not accepted upstream because of conflicts or, or maintainer refuse for some reasons. But if we have some uh, documented use cases that shows that a particular patch provides some benefit, we are, we are willing to accept and maintain that even if it's not upstream. Uh, and then in the meantime, we try to, we always try to upstream all the, all the secret source patches that we have. Uh, it, it's a way to, you know, you, you can't, uh, if, if, if upstream accepts a patch, we are super happy because we don't have to maintain. Uh, if it's not accepted and we, we can still provide support for uh, the specific hardware, the specific component, or specific feature that was required, and um, so yeah, most of our contributions are bug fixes. Sometimes there's a chance to work, especially with some cloud partners, to work on specific projects uh, that require to write some some kernel code, and like usually we we try to contribute one hundred percent as soon as possible because it means less work for us, uh, <laughs> I, I know some feedback from the, you know, from the best programmers in the world. <laughs> if you <laughs> post your code to the Linux kernel mailing list, you get a review from people that really understand how to do programming. Uh, so there's, it's, it's always a win-win situation. Okay, we've got some a couple of questions. Uh, one from uh, Diego: How much patching occurs on the Ubuntu side for things that are specific for Ubuntu? Um, yeah, that's that's like it's an interesting question. Usually, we don't have specific. I mean, we have specific features on Ubuntu, but they rely on on standard kernel features. We rarely need. Uh, specific kernel features that are only provided by Ubuntu. Most of the source patches, like I was saying, uh, are optimizations. Like we have some, some source patches to optimize the boot time uh, in the cloud because the, the Ubuntu distribution is used a lot in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So we, we care a lot about the, this, the very specific use case of booting uh, instances, booting cloud instances really fast. For this, we have some optimization patches. We also have source patches for specific hardware support, like some components. Like I met that. Like I think, yeah, today this morning I applied a source patch uh, for a watchdog driver that was um, supported by. Uh, don't remember what kind of laptop had that that watchdog driver. The driver was not upstream. Uh, so I, I looked at the patch. It was basically adding a few defines uh, and, and a, a, a code into a table. So the patch was pretty safe. Uh, but because it, it was not uh, upstream, I had to apply as a source patch. So in this way, we have the support for that specific hardware. Um, and, and I asked the, the person that submitted that patch to our list to please send also that upstream so in the meantime we can get a feedback and we uh, you know and we have we can determine if it's if it's a good patch uh, that can go upstream or not uh, but maintaining the development kernel is uh, I, sometimes I need to do stuff like this I, I accept the drivers or changes that one was pretty safe I would say because it was really a minimal patch but that that's part of the of the job <laughs> okay so i have another question that uh, uh you might oh uh, are you you uh, yes i know yeah. i'm seeing that <laughs> the <laughs> question yeah, yeah you you didn't caught my attention in in the chat <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's a hot topic it's it's really interesting because it it's 
claiming to provide awesome performance for IO. It's everything is properly asynchronous. Before there was a sync IO that was kind of, uh, it was asynchronous, but uh, there were many restrictions. IO Ring is a, is a really clean interface. Uh, and basically, that it reduces, uh, yeah, how can you say? It reduces the overhead of communicating between user space and kernel space. Um, so everything that can work by doing the zero copy, because usually when you read from a device, uh, uh, the standard way is to like create a buffer in user space, uh, do a system call. The kernel calls the driver that copies the memory using either DMA or the CPU, copies the, the data from the media, could be a, a hard drive or a network device, and it copies everything in kernel memory. And then everything is copied from kernel memory to user space. That's just for a read. So the data flows in the buffer three times because one time for the DMA from the network card, let's say, to main kernel memory. Then it goes from kernel memory to the CPU registers, and then from the CPU registers to user space. So three, three times. If you do a zero copy, it means that you initialize a user space buffer. Then you instruct the kernel to do that zero copy, and the data goes directly into the user space buffer. Uh, that plus some asynchronous mechanism so that you can you don't have to wait you can like in program fire off something and the kernel takes care of, of of completing the copy and notifying your user space program when everything is done that's it's my understanding of io uring <laughs> <laughs> that's the feature that it provides and it's pretty cool the downside of that is that it's a new feature and like any new feature is the question is is it tested enough? Uh, probably yes nowadays, because it's it's been quite a while that uh, it's out, so it's more reliable nowadays. But there are still some potential issues. Uh, we had, I think, a couple of CVEs. Uh, CVEs are, are like critical security fixes related to IOU ring. Uh, but that's like, I guess it's the normal uh, workflow for a new feature. And this is why Kernel developers are a lot reclutant to the, they don't like to accept new features because they expose uh, <laughs> the kernel to potential security issues. And that that's an interesting topic that that would be nice to talk about the security aspect. Yeah, so just quickly because before we end this stream, last uh, last question from Diego uh, talking about security. Uh, how about uh, evaluation for those patch? How is that done? Code reviews, static code analytics, analysis fusing fusing not fusing <laughs> <laughs> yeah all of the above <laughs> okay. it starts oh, with, a, with a code review usually the patch is posted to the mailing list we do a code review we are, if we decide to accept the patch uh, uh, obviously there are some rules to respect like there must be a properly created um, bug in 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 launchpad for in our case uh, uh, and you need to describe what the patch is doing, why we need to apply the patch. Is it fixing any bug? What are the regression potentials? When you motivate all of that, we can decide to accept the patch. Uh, when the patch is accepted and we, we uh, release a new kernel or we, uh, we, we have like private PPAs where, where that we use to test kernels before release, uh, all the kernels, we, in all the kernels, we run a set of tests. Um, most of them are, we, we rely on other projects, but we also have custom tests uh, uh, internally in, in Canonical. Uh, we, we run static analysis tools internally. Uh, but fuzzing, yes, we have some tests. We are, we are using StressNG, that is a tool that is stressing the system. And you can you can it, it's doing some fuzzing if I remember correctly. So we we're also doing some some fuzzing like the system call is calling random system calls with random parameters to stress the system call system, but stress the kernel in general. And yeah, that's that's one of the tests. 
uh, that we do. So there's a like a big part of my day is is I need to spend a lot of time to review all these test results and and figure out if something is broken and determine why it's broken. If it if it's a security bug, it's going to be problematic because the we're going to need to release a, que- a new kernel as soon as possible. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Okay. So last last word, the last question, I, I said it was, but I'm going to ask myself a, a last question. Did you ever had a catastrophic release of a kernel that something like you had to immediately publish something because it was crashing uh, users' uh. <laughs> machines and, and like it's everyone on deck can work, you know, Days and nights until it's fixed. Did did you ever had something like that, or or is yeah. the process really safe? Well, f- fortunately, I haven't have never I've never experienced uh, the, such a bad uh, crash. <laughs> or so. No, usually we can we can detect uh, pretty reliably. Like if there's an obvious, uh, really big big problem, like the system is not booting or or it crashes immediately at boot uh, as we're also testing a lot of different architectures i have experienced re- kernel released with with bugs uh even the last release in uh, uh in, in the last uh, impish release uh, there was a pretty nasty zfs bug so we had to do like what we call a zero day uh update basically as soon as the kernel is out we release an, an update uh, and because it was it was not super critical like you had to do specific actions like create a snapshot and stress the file system and there was a potential corruption with zfs but uh yeah if it happens we can we usually we we, we, we try to do uh we, we have a way to of releasing doing critical releases as soon as possible Okay, so we're we're pretty safe, and we should not be afraid of doing sudo apt update regularly. Yeah, no, no, and, that's, and that's like, yeah, always do the apt update and apt upgrade yeah. because that that's the safest option. If you don't do that, uh, who knows? Maybe there are bugs so still right. there. Okay, well, we've reached the end of this room. It's been an hour, an hour already. So thank you very much, Andrea, for joining me on this uh, on this interview. Uh, the oh, no, the first you. of hopefully uh, many. I have a feeling you you're gonna come back because I I have I feel like you have something more to say about uh, different yeah. stuff. So <laughs> yeah, I feel like I haven't shown anything. Like, <laughs> well, maybe we can do like a, a practical debug session or something like that. Um, sure, sure. With with the the, the kernel. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining us in the chat, either on YouTube or uh, Twitch. Um, and uh, well, uh, that's it for this uh, stream. Uh, I will be back in two weeks. I don't know exactly uh, what is going to be the subject in two weeks. But in the meantime, uh, Andrea, where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you about either the kernel or the violin? Well, you can you can uh, find me on Twitter. There's my where it is here at yeah. Rigi on Twitter. <laughs> you can ping me there. Uh, you can also find me on Twitch. Uh, I rarely talk about kernel though on Twitch, uh, but I have a, a Twitch channel, a Rigi Violin. Uh, if you want to hang out, uh, if you have yeah. kernel questions, I'm happy to to respond to that. Usually, I play violin there, but <laughs> uh, but uh, sometimes I also do just chatting sessions. So I'm always happy to to talk about more programming things <laughs> so, all right so, yeah. so uh don't forget to uh follow uh the ubuntu on our channel either on twitch or on youtube for more content it's not always me it's uh often someone else uh monica is uh is driving the channel uh usually uh so i will be back in two weeks thank you for watching and have a good end of your day bye bye uh, andrea and see you soon Bye. Thank you.